Thank you very much. Um, welcome everybody to July Health in Hackney. Um, um, I've got apologies from lateness from Councillor um, Snell, who's in on holiday in Scotland, as I understand it, and apologies from our Director of Social Care, Helen uh, Woodland. Um, can I just go through the housekeeping matters? This is a hybrid meeting. I'm joined by uh, three councillors and myself in the chamber. Councillor Pluvier is joining us remotely. Um, it's being live streamed, recorded. Members of the press will be watching. Please keep your microphones on mute when you're not speaking. Only unmute to speak. Please keep your cameras on. Please don't start conversations in the chat other than just to say you have a question, but otherwise please try and raise your hand if you have a question. I haven't been notified of any um, urgent items of um, uh, declarations of interest, sorry. And so with that, um, I can we can go into the first item on the agenda, which is item number four, which is the update with respect to COVID and vaccinations. We're going to be joined, we are joined right now by Dr. Sandra Husbands, our Director of Public Health. And we will be joined, hopefully, in due course by Siobhan Harper, who is the director uh, for the transition from the CCG and is on the vaccination steering group. Um, we were sent earlier on today a helpful uh, presentation with data which took us up to the 6th of July. Um, so, Sandra, if I can hand over for you and then no doubt we'll, we'll see if Siobhan joins, but there'll be some questions, hopefully. Uh, Sandra, over to you. Oh, we've, we've lost your sound there, Sandra. Lots of, lots of sun on my camera. Okay. Can got you hear you, me yeah. now? Yeah, yeah, got you. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Hayes. So, um, oh, and here's Siobhan. <laughs> we, were, we were going to start with the conversation about the vaccine um, programme, which Siobhan was going to, to lead, but seeing she's just got here, I'll give her a bit of breathing space. And if we can go to slide... Um, sorry, there's no numbers on these. It is... Um, oh, I see. You're, it could be seven. Yeah, seven. I'm with you. The weekly trends, um, and I'll just um, give a bit of the background um, and context to you know um, what's happening with the infection rates, and um, and it, it helps us understand the importance of the vaccine um, program and what we have left to do. Um, so the. Um, bar chart on the slide is, is showing you the um, numbers of cases by week and um, and then we've got the incidence rate there so when I say by week it's a seven day period and the, the most recent seven day period by the time we produced the slide was up to the 29th of June as, as you know that there's always a, a few days four or five days where the data are a bit uncertain <coughs> So always looking at these slightly in arrear, in arrears. Um, what you can't see from this graph, because it would have been too small to put the whole thing on there, is that um, this curve is looking remarkably now like the one from sort of mid-September. Um, so, and, and we're still in a rising um, part of the surge. And this is um, a nationwide surge in cases. You may have even heard on the news earlier that we've um, uh, reached five five hundred. Thousand um, um, infections today, um, and that's a significant rise um, from from even from yesterday. So cases are doubling roughly every nine days for us at the moment. But that's also the, the doubling time is also shrinking as well as the numbers of of cases increasing. So we're in a sort of an exponential rise at the moment, and. Um, to put this in context, um, this, these are the sort of infection rates we had around September, um, October. Um, you can't really compare it to the very first peak of the um, epidemic in the UK because we weren't testing everybody. Um, but it's but in terms of just the number of people reporting sick, it's it's um, higher than in that first peak, but we haven't reached anything like the the, the um, peak of that surge that happened in autumn winter, where we were reaching around a thousand um, cases per hundred thousand per week. Um, but 
we're still on the, in the rising part of this curve and we don't know when it's, when it's, going, to, when it's going to peak or at what level. Um, and then the, the next slide um, shows you that the majority of cases are occurring in, in young adults. Now, actually, that's always been true all the way through the pandemic. But what we've also seen um, during the other periods is that although the, major the majority were in young adults, that the, um, there was less of a differential between the different age groups, except that there were much fewer in children. But the other older age groups, you know, the, the, the lines would kind of be more parallel to each other, whereas you can see that there's um, been um, not really a rise in the over 60s for, for us locally, certainly not up until the 29th of June, which is really good news, um, because that is the most vulnerable group by age group in terms of um, severe illness or death. Um, there's been... Um, a bit of an increase in the older working age group recently um, and as you can see it, um, young people 0 to 19 have also been driving some of that but, but the majority of it has been um, not just the, the numbers but there's been a steeper increase in the 20 to 39 year age group and then in terms of what what particular virus type is driving that the um, delta variant has now completely taken over from the alpha variant as the dominant strain of variant of virus um, um, driving infections for us locally and it's the dominant one across the whole of London and that's shown on, on the next slide. Um, so we know, just to, to give you a bit more context, you may have discussed this last time, sorry I wasn't here, so if I'm repeating anything you've heard before, do let me know. But this is a more transmissible virus, as in it's more um, easy to pass from person to person. Um, and um, if you if you so if you haven't been vaccinated or you've had only one dose of the vaccination, it's much easier to get infected with this virus and to become ill. But for those people who've had both doses of vaccine, there's actually pretty good protection against this this variant, which is the dominant one now. But um, as you will know, we have um, a fair proportion of our population, both in terms of the vulnerable groups in those first one um, to nine um, joint committee on vaccines and immunizations cohorts. So that's the people over 50 and people who are clin clinically vulnerable and clinically extremely vulnerable, um, as well as health and social care workers and carers. Um, we've still got a, a, a fair proportion of people in those groups who haven't been vaccinated yet for a number of reasons and we may discuss that um, after Siobhan's um, had an opportunity to talk through the program as well as all the younger people who've only m much more recently had an opportunity to get vaccinated. Thanks Sandra. Um, Siobhan. Are you okay to start Siobhan? <laughs> or do you want me to carry on a bit? <laughs> I can't believe you started so quickly today. I was literally two minutes late and you were already getting stuck in. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you. So um, yeah, so in terms of the programme, um, and forgive me for people who've heard this already today at the uh, Integrated Care Partnership Board this morning, but um, really the highlights are, as Sandra says, so that um, since we last met, there has been a, a major... Um, drive across London in terms of providing additional capacity in order to both allow the younger, the over 18s, all adults to have received their first dose by the by the um, end of July as, at the latest really and then for us in particular to really push forward on completing second doses for um, those who are due to have them but also um, to keep uh, addressing the low uptake that we have in those those um, more vulnerable groups that uh, Sandra just mentioned, and so for us that's that's been a, a you know that's been an intense focus across London. Um, I mean, all of London has been struggling to some extent because of uh, having a much younger population. So rates are have always been slightly lower than some of the rest of the country, but the level of the level of um, reporting and uh, expectation has been really pushed um, and that has meant that we have had to really increase capacity in terms of what the you know the, the numbers of appointments that are available for people to to have vaccination um, and so we have done some really good work actually um, 
in terms of pulling together as a local system, um, working with uh, the PCNs who have now taken on fully running the local vaccination centres, uh, working community pharmacy has been outstanding really in terms of their contribution. Uh, we have really ramped up our our regularised programme of outreach work now and our pop up work, and that's been. Um, it's been consistent and um, f frequent, but you know, again, not necessarily delivering massive numbers. But it's it's got it's really got going and has got established working uh, in partnership with the community champions and building that kind of uh, word out on the street. We've also factored in. Um, you probably are aware of, of the event that's planned this weekend in the service centre with the Homerton, who've rapidly become Pfizer authorised um, in. Um, a really short turnaround time in order to us to be able to provide this additional capacity locally in order to maximize the opportunity for people to to uh, accept vaccination we've really tried to encourage uh, as much walk-in um, availability as we can for people we have also uh, commissioned some additional centralized call and recall capacity within primary care so that we can particularly chase those who've in the earlier the earlier cohorts who who may now may have just been missed out from from a process point of view because of managing some of that bureaucracy but also people who may now have changed their minds given the sort of increasing number of cases etc so a vast amount of activity some of the difficulties that we still have our demand is just not coming forward i mean that's one of our biggest concerns really in a way so uh Again, not necessarily unique to Hackney. It's certainly a picture across northeast London. London has actually been, uh, I think it's even a picture nationally, but um, London has been quite busy with terms of delivery of vaccines. Um, it's taken uh, like 20% of the, of the country's activity this, in this last few days. So it's, it's, doing, it's doing its absolute best. Um, but we're, what we're struggling with at the moment is trying to fill some of the slots that we've made available. Um, so that's that's a challenge, and that's a. I mean, we had a discussion this morning about in the, the work that we need to continue to do with uh, young people and how we how we engage with young people in different settings and how that might be a you know a consistent program that we need to keep uh, keep focusing on, uh, irrespective of the nineteenth of July sort of deadline, really, and keep that momentum up. Then the other thing just to add, I suppose, is that we've got more clarity now on the booster program that we will be starting in September. Um, that will run from the, around the 5th of September to the 16th of December. It will be, again, focusing on those more vulnerable cohorts uh, in the first instance and um, will be, we think, run alongside the flu, the flu program in terms of capacity. but. We don't think that we're not. We have still haven't had confirmation about the two vaccines being able to be delivered at the same time. So complicated picture ahead, um, and you know a sustained effort that we're going to have to really keep going until at least the end of the calendar year. I would say. Thanks, thanks. And just on that, what's the best best evidence then as to at the point, say for the vulnerable cohorts who may have been some of the first vaccinated? How how long does the effectiveness to a high level of the vaccine last before it starts to drop off um uh, and you know it, so in other words if, if you started to get both those doses around say january february that will be what's starting to wane in september time is yeah that i think the i mean i think the maximum i've heard is up to a year but i think it's anything between six months to a year really and so yeah they'll be the they'll be the first people so people in care homes people over 80 you know they'll be the first the first cohorts that we will be We'll be revaccinating in in the autumn. Thanks, Siobhan. Um I mean, I've got further questions. But before I do, let's go and see. It. Any members? Any members have any um, questions? I mean, yes, yeah, I Councillor Adams. I have a question. Yeah. The question is that uh, there has been uh, some concern about different type of uh, AstraZeneca out there. So, what is the difference between the uh, woman partial in, uh, in Europe and the woman partial in India? So the the, 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 um, the I think this there was a story here about a plant that wasn't licensed in India producing AstraZeneca, yeah. and right. there's been some concern about that. I, I, I can answer that. It's, it's actually not that the plant isn't licensed. So um, it's that um, it's the it's the the plant is the Serum Institute of India, which is actually the largest vaccine manufacturer in the world, and it's perfectly 
normal and regulated etc and it's and it's providing the it's develop it's pr producing the AstraZeneca vaccine under license from Oxford and, and AstraZeneca so everything it's doing it's exactly the same vaccine everything it's doing is is fine the, the only issue is that in EEA countries it would have to be um, that specific vaccine manufactured in that um, plant would have to be um, approved by the EMA and it hasn't been doesn't mean it won't be but it hasn't been yet but um, they they actually so far haven't licensed or, or um, approved any vaccines that have been manufactured outside of Europe or the US anyway so far. Fine. So it doesn't if it has a UK license but not a at the currently it doesn't have a license in some EU states. That's right. Well, all EU states, because they all have the same regulator, but other European states outside of the EU, it could be, and I wouldn't know the detail. We'd have to look that up. Um, thank you. And Councillor Augusts Canley? Thank you, Chair. Uh, just to follow on a question from, from um, the previous discussion, there were talks about 4 million of those vaccinations uh, being used in the UK. Do we know if any of those are administered, those Hackney residents? Because some EU countries are stating that they will not be um, deemed acceptable if they were the ones um, produced from India uh, for people who are planning going away on holiday in the next couple of months. Uh, and the second question was in relation to uh, care workers. Uh, if we could get an update on the care workers' uptake, uptake on the vaccine, that would be great. Thank you. Um, well, I, I don't know, Sandra, if you, I mean, I don't know anything about this AstraZeneca serial coding or whatever, whether that would be identifiable. Um, yeah, so apparently it is identifiable, but you wouldn't know when you were vaccinated. So you would have to be able to link your batch number back to the manufacturer, and we would probably have to ask the central supplier, um, you know, whether any of those have been allocated <laughs> to Hackney, but that's not information that we have. No. And then, but then I suppose the question for the public might be is if they're not, I suppose would be if, if other EU countries don't start allowing people in, unless you can prove you didn't have that one. But I don't think we're in that space nationally yet, are we? Well, I haven't heard that. But Well, what we, we haven't heard any e, that EU countries are saying you can't come in if you've had that vaccine it, but it would might it would probably mean that they would treat you like you weren't vaccinated so eu states that are currently allowing uk um residents or nationals to travel there um because some of them aren't anyway just because of our infection rates but those that are allowing um people from the uk to travel there are requiring pcr tests and if they're not uh, or for some they're saying if you have had um two doses of vaccine you don't require the test but if if you've if you've got the wrong batch number, then you'd probably need to still get tested. Right, so it would fall back to the, the default. Um, yeah. Should, 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 should of, yeah, I was just, should I pick up the care workers? That was the only Yeah, thing yeah, and can I just dovetail there as well? I mean, I saw, I saw the week on week figure great for the age group. What we don't have is a week on week for some of the care home and particularly the domiciliary. So I just wonder if that could be added in. Okay. If, if you can build that into your sort of reply. Okay. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sandra, just while we're waiting for Siobhan to um, uh, join us back, could you just update us on a story that was in, I think, The Guardian uh, last weekend in terms of Hackney having one of the lowest um payouts of the track and trace payments and i think there's a sort of quite a solid response there but could you just provide us with, with i told with... you i was on a call greta sorry, sorry. <laughs> um siobhan i'm just going to ask um sandra to update us on the track and trace payments then we'll come back to you for a care home update sandra yeah so um i we don't administer the the, the test and trace um, payments from public health so I don't have all of the details but um, as I understand it the information in the Guardian article was accurate they um, obtained it through a freedom of information request the issue is not just for us but for all the local authorities that it's really difficult to um, 
distribute the the self-isolation payments, which is what we're talking about for people who don't know, don't know what we're talking about, is the £500 self-isolation payment. It's difficult to distribute them because it's actually quite difficult to qualify. So very few people meet the eligibility criteria. Not that we don't have people who need financial support to self-isolate who live in Hackney, but you have to be um, in receipt of certain benefits in order to qualify for the payment. So you could actually be working, you know, working poor, or even working and not that poor in normal circumstances, but have precarious income or, you know, it's changes of circumstances in terms of the way that your um, work or your pay um, was was happening over the course of the pandemic and find it really difficult to manage if you couldn't go out to work for a couple of weeks. Um, but you still wouldn't be eligible for the £500. So in other words, it, it, we, we may have one of the lowest rates of payout, but in reality, we're hamstrung by the national guidelines with respect to it. Yes, I think, <coughs> excuse me, I think there may have been, but you'd probably need to check this with Jennifer Winter and her team, but the, the, there may have been an issue as well that with the cyber attack, meaning that we, we couldn't verify some people's eligibility, but quite a lot of people just aren't eligible. Okay, thank you. Um, Siobhan, can I um, return to you in the care homes, uh, um, if I can, please? Sorry, just flicking between screens there. Uh, yes, um, so care homes has improved in the, in, in the context of Hackney Council's work. They've been doing um, very direct work at sort of patient, individual patient level and also resident level and also with individual staff members. So they... In terms of the, the targets that were set for them, um, uh, they have kind of really made a huge impact on that, and, uh, and 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 really have reached a lot of more understanding about what some of the barriers might be to for certain individuals, and then putting in individual bespoke action plans really around getting those individuals vaccinated, whether they're staff or uh, residents. There is definitely um, some work to do around home care. Um, Helen, I don't think she's on the call tonight, but she definitely, yesterday at our steering group, um, did say that there was more work to be done in, in, that, in that context for the domiciliary care workers. Um, and then I guess, I mean, Catherine's on the call tonight as well, but the Homerton in particular has um, in the 90% with their staff uh, vaccination rates as well. So um, have done a really good, amazing job there in terms of, ensuring that's the coverage there so you, um, we could definitely bring that back the next time about progress if that's yeah helpful. yeah so, i mean i'm looking at page five of the handout which is very helpful because i mean i think this is the first time i've seen a line item i don't think it was here last month for domiciliary care and non-registered settings and they're obviously the two that stand out yeah as having a low first second rate so, I mean, yeah, really, it's just, you know, the, the, the extra effort and what we've learned from the care homes and people's concerns to double and triple efforts. Yes, I think it's, it depends as well which, with which agency. I think that um, some of the agencies are, are doing much better than others. I know Helen mentioned just a, one, one of the main agencies that Hackney work with are, at the, are nearer the 90% range, where some of the others are much lower. So... Um, you're looking at, I think, more of a global figure there rather than the individual yeah. organisation. Okay. Thanks, Siobhan. Um, Catherine, I see you've got your hand raised there. Do you want to come in? Yeah, I just, well, just on, on the domiciliary care, I think one of the challenges that, that probably Helen would have articulated is if you have the names of the staff, there's quite a laborious process to check. They may well have been vaccinated. So they may well have been vaccinated somewhere within London, but actually not within necessarily a city and Hackney service. And actually to find that out is quite time consuming. So actually there is work being done, which is about that validation. Um, and just, yeah, just to confirm our position, we have um, as a trust vaccinated of the frontline staff, which is over 90%. And for all our staff, we're a few decimal points less than eight and um, ninety percent. So um, we've actually met the target that was expected of um, NHS organisations in terms of COVID vaccine. Thank you, Catherine. That's helpful to know. And Sandra, just just to add that we're also continuing to reach out to um, care staff, both home um, home care um, or domiciliary care and care home staff. Um, 
and um, did a webinar just a couple of days ago. There's um, an NHS um, webinar next week and we're um, trying to organise something for the domiciliary care staff which is a bit more difficult because they you know, are all over the place and um, working in different places and don't necessarily have access to computers at, um, during the work day but um, we may uh, may be able to meet them um, um, in person to, to be able to talk through some of the issues that they're having. Um, we do know that um, among that group of staff the there's quite a lot of concern around particular um, ideas. They're not they're they're not re really well founded, but they're very well promulgated um, ideas about the vaccine, particularly about um, the idea that it might affect people's fertility, for which there's no evidence. And so that's what next week's webinar is about. And and we're we're continuing to just reach out, answer all their questions, and make good quality of avail information available to them, as well as making the vaccine. Um, more convenient for them to get and in terms of at the moment i think the national um vaccination group hasn't recommended any child or anyone below the age of 18 to get it um it, it, from what you know are we waiting on any further information or review or evidence or could this be coming down the line i mean a, a lot of other european countries as i understand it are yeah. vaccinating but below 18. So it could be. So at the moment, the the, the vaccine is actually licensed from 16 on. So we could actually vaccinate 16 to 18 year olds without having to any have any change in in approvals or licensing. But it's not licensed for children, and um, for the very good reason that it wasn't ever tested on children to begin with. But they they have done a trial in the United States and have also started rolling out the vaccine in in um, 12 to 16 year olds there as well. Um, which is what, what um, the um, European states who are vaccination children are also doing, so no, nobody younger than 12. Um, and the um, JCVI is, is looking at the evidence and the MHRA will also look at the evidence to see whether it can grant a license for that. But that doesn't necessarily mean that if it's licensed that that will be um, strategically what we're going to do in the UK, that that is still a, a matter for discussion. Fine. And so we're, you're at the hands essentially of national government, but you're ready to stay if you need to stand up a service in schools, outside schools, on parent choice, however it works. If that's what happens, you'll, you'll obviously follow that national lead. Yeah, absolutely. Fine. Um, Malcolm, I've got a question from you. Yeah. Um, could I just ask what the situation or what the policy is for young people and adults who, who, who are immunosuppressed? I mean, what, what, what exactly... Uh, happens to those people and how, and how do they get protection? So d regardless of the particular vaccine or the nature of their immunosuppression, so if they've got a, a condition, either a congenital condition or an acquired condition, like maybe they've had cancer treatment or something that's caused people to not have a particularly effective immune system, that doesn't mean that they shouldn't get vaccinated and they are still offered vaccines and the recommendation from JCVI is that people who are immunosuppressed should still be offered the COVID vaccine but um, they just may not make as good a immune response to it as people who haven't got immunosuppression and therefore of course have to continue to take we all actually need to continue to take precautions um, even when we've been vaccinated particularly at this point in time when there is um, there are high levels of um, virus in circulation and it's increasing it just means that your likelihood of coming into contact with someone who's infected is much higher and of course your likelihood of that of um, passing on the virus to somebody even if you've been vaccinated is is high in a population where we have um, a significant proportion of people unvaccinated so um, but at, at whatever point we get to say 90 percent of people adults um, or everyone over 16 who's had two doses of, of the relevant vaccine and, they, and we know they've got good protection there will still be people who haven't made a particularly good immune response and some of those will have immunosuppression some of them will just be you know older people because you're in your um, the function of your immune system like every other system in your body wanes with age and um, that's one of the reasons for, for doing the booster vaccines but it also is a reason to continue to take precautions say in care homes or around people that we know are vulnerable and just, just thank you very much and, and sandra going to a place where post 19th of july if the government carries on with its 
current plan and, and the end of all restrictions in terms of what messaging we're putting in place in Hackney in terms of what precautions you can take. Um, we obviously saw Andy Burnham and other things coming out earlier on in the week making sort of um, uh, quite coherent um, arguments as, as to why, for example, people should carry on wearing masks. To what extent is it also just making people aware that perhaps Hackney is on the more vulnerable side because of its low uptake of vaccine? Are you working through a comms um, plan um, for, for that situation? So, yes, we are working through a com communications plan for the for post July 19th, but actually we've been putting those messages out all along. So we've been making it clear that um, it, that people need to get vaccinated, that they need two vaccines and that they need to continue with the, um, you know, when they when it was the regulations, um, hands, face, space, etc. Actually, only some of it was regulated. So and you were only required by law to wear a face covering in crowded public buildings and in um, public transport. But actually, we, we always recommended that people should um, use face coverings as much as possible when they were in crowded, particularly indoor spaces, um, because it helps pr protect you and protect other people. And we always re we continue to recommend as much distancing as possible and the, the hygiene. So to be clear, um, although the 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 regulations come to an end on the 19th of July, so you know, the government is no longer telling you that you need to work from home or that you must work from home. But that doesn't mean that um, the opposite is true and that you must now go into wherever your workplace is. That will be something, a conversation between individuals and their um, their employers, but there will be some employers and there are already some um, organisations locally and, and around um, England who are saying well I'm not bringing everybody back because you know the virus hasn't gone away and we still need to take precautions so just because the restrictions have ended doesn't mean that we stop taking precautions the virus hasn't gone away it's not the end of the pandemic and even well if we get to December and everyone's been vaccinated and everyone's had their booster as long as there's still the virus circulating in the rest of the world it won't be the end of the pandemic and we'll still be um, at the mercy of importing new variants that may cause um, infections even in people who've been vaccinated. So continuing with precautions is something that we're going, we, we will be advocating and we have been developing our communications both for um, businesses and um, employers as well as for individuals. But with Hackney having, I mean, cause in some senses, it might not be something politically that or um, leadership wise we want to promote sort of that Hackney has one of the lowest lead, um, lowest um, vaccination rates because it makes it, a, it might, it might cause in some people's eyes, it might make it appear as if we haven't done a good enough job or as other people, we all know, but in fact that we've got many inbuilt structural challenges and age demographics as to why that is. But do, do we need, is, is there scope and is there the willingness to actually let other people know that because we are arguably more vulnerable than other places because of that low vaccination rate? And is that something we should actually not be ashamed of or worried about, but actually educate and inform people of? Well, we have actually been using that information and um, I I um, said it at the, I don't actually remember the date, but at the London Health Committee um, a couple of weeks ago, I think it was, um, and um, even gave the figures and it was reported on the BBC. But also we've been in our local communications have been making the point that with so many, particularly the vulnerable groups, unvaccinated at all, let alone having you know, it's not just that the wait, but they're waiting to get their second dose. Some of them have not had one. Um, we um, that leaves us leaves us as a whole community open to um, significant um, local epidemic, and those people in particular really vulnerable to very severe illness. So um, that is one of the things that you know, obviously we we couch it in ways that people will understand and that aren't intended to frighten but to help people understand the situation so they can be motivated to get vaccinated but also to continue taking precautions. Thanks Andrew. I've got a last question from Council August Canley. Thank you Chair. Uh, just a question on uh, guidance changing in two weeks time. Um, when that happens what is the position um, of Hackney Council in relation to its employees? Do we have a firm position on that or is it yet to be decided? 
well we do have a position and um which is that it's the same position we've had for a few months which is that um we are not likely to start bringing people back into the um into hackney council buildings to work in the, on a big scale before September obviously we'll ha there'll be various reviews before we get to September so we won't, we're not just saying that when we get to September everybody comes back so at the moment the service centre and other buildings are open for people who need to come into Hackney to, or into the buildings to do their, their work or because they have difficulty working from home for one reason or another but the, the majority of people are being asked to stay at home um, of, as you know we've um, uh, made a number of adaptations to the buildings to um, to make them COVID secure and we're not planning to re reverse any of that at the moment when we bring staff back full time as it well not full time that's not quite how to put it when we bring everybody back at whatever point we do that we might have to review some of it because we may not be able to um, space people out quite as much as they are now and we may not be able to maintain the one-way system in order for people to get effectively around the building but th these are all things that we're um, that are under discussion on an ongoing basis and we keep looking at that both in terms of um, what the evidence is telling us about how to reduce the amount of infection but also um, where we are in terms of what the infection rates are Thank you, Simon. Um, with that, and I think certainly that's something maybe in our um, that come, come September, October, we're sort of exploring in more detail in terms of our own um, our own policies. Um, I'll draw this item to a close. Thank you very, very much, um, Siobhan and Sandra, for that very helpful update. Um, can I now turn to item number five, which is the Homerton Quality Account, the document that every year the Homerton uh, has to produce. I think it's in more truncated form uh, than it sometimes usually is because of the um, work being taken up with the pandemic. We're usually joined at this time as we are now by Catherine Pelly, who's the chief um, nurse. Congratulations, Ch um, Catherine, on your MBE. Um, we we're very proud of you and, and the work that Homerton have uh, done over the last year and a half. So, uh, and also we were just discussing before we started the meeting, how the Homerton has been uh, recommended, who is up for three separate awards, um, two from the Health Service Journal and one from the Royal College of Nursing in terms of some of its rapid uh, response work during the first wave and patient safety work. So um, we'll await um, the, the, the more information on that. But again, congratulations on the hard work. Catherine, can I hand over for you um, for your say introduction to the quality accounts? And then there might be, as there usually is, a wide range of questions uh, to you to anything Homerton related. Uh, yes, thank you. And thank you for your acknowledgement um, about my honour. A, a, a lovely surprise. I'm still a bit overwhelmed. Um, yeah, so just uh, by way of context, we have to uh, write a quality account uh, set out in uh, statute and regulation. Um, uh, we were um, actually earlier this year told that we wouldn't actually have to produce one this year. And then there was a change um, from that. Um, so we ended up with a very short timescale to produce the report and uh, particularly thanks to the stakeholders um, including the council who um, at much shorter notice provided their um, uh, responses to us to allow us to meet the deadline of publishing this on the 30th of June which we did last week. Um, so what you have is the accounts which set out um, and I think I explain this every year as set out in the regulation or the wording is mandated and the format is mandated so it's um, quite a wordy and weighty tone, setting out not only some of the stuff that we've we've achieved in relation to um, the pandemic, but also recognising that we have also carried on um, uh, throughout the year caring for um, patients and, our, and families and communities across City and Hackney in a number of different ways. Um, uh, it demonstrates a, um, a maintenance of performance um, despite the challenges of the pandemic, I, I would say. And it does pick up some of the aspects of the, 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 the pandemic as inevitably next year's account will do as well. Um, uh, we are in the process of, uh, as we always do, creating a shorter summary version and that should be ready for our um, annual members meeting later on um, this year. 
and we will um, ask committee to respond to the feedback from the stakeholders um, where relevant. So we've got um, to respond back to Health Watch and to the CCG. Um, uh, and yeah, so that was it really. I'm, um, probably easy to take the questions that I'm sure will be uh, varied. Thank you. Um, uh, Catherine, can I just kick off again, just on the sort of the, can you, from the Hobbiton's perspective, can you just give us a, a, a COVID update? And also, I mean, is it right to say that people's admissions into hospital are shorter and they're not escalating up as much as they were previously, perhaps vaccine related or, or what have you. Can you just give us your, your um, where we are at the moment from a, a homotor perspective on COVID? Uh, yes, so I think um, probably what I would I would say is that over the last, well, since wave, wave two, we've always had um, a small um, handful of patients within the hospital with COVID. So we, we Unlike wave one, we came to a point where there was nobody in the hospital. We've not seen that position uh, this year. We've got down to very small single figures, but we've we've always been running um, one of our wards as a what we you know COVID COVID ward. Um, what we've probably seen um, in the last uh, few days, in particular, is an increasing number of patients um, who are requiring to be admitted into um, a bed um, on the hospital site so we've gone from about an average of six or seven a day to 15 16 a day and and people aren't staying particularly long time so we're not we've not got long lengths of stay in the way that maybe we did um uh, when there were larger numbers of patients in the hospital and um at, at the moment there's a um, single number of patients in our itu so i think um, this morning there was one patient in ITU with COVID and one who was um, suspected to have COVID. So it's a very different picture, but we are seeing an increasing trend. Now, of course, our community services will be caring for people in the community who may well have COVID. We may not know that, or we may know that if they've um, uh, already had a, a positive uh, swab. So those services are also going to be managing um, the, the, the pandemic. What we are doing, um, as you probably expect, is making sure that we are able to understand the, the planning um, to um, adapt our services should we need to, if the numbers of patients that require an admission increase, how we would manage um, the increasing demand on um, uh, our critical care beds and how we would in manage increasing demand on our community services and what that redeployment would, would look like. I think it's also fair to say that we're doing quite a lot of other planning about the impact of winter and what winter will look like and particularly um, what that will look like for children with um, respiratory viruses um, expected to increase quite significantly over the next few weeks and months. And out of interest, just on that point, I, I can see uh, Malcolm's hand a lot. <laughs> As far as I understand it, the Delta, we obviously know the Delta variant is more transmissible amongst children. Are, are you seeing children um, starting to come through with respiratory um, um, illnesses as a consequence of that? Or is it just that you're concerned more about the, the combination of flu winter uh, pressures? So what we're seeing in, in, in children, we, we, we're seeing... We, We've had a, you know, a, a single number of children with who are COVID positive who require admission. It's very, very small numbers, thankfully. We are seeing, um, uh, we've seen an increase in children with general um, with spiritual illnesses that require admission. Um, and, and some of those are quite young children who haven't been exposed um, to kind of viruses because of social restrictions over the last um, 18 months. I think what we're what we're trying to track is what's been seen um, in in Australia, and that tells us quite a lot about what we might see. But it is our, um, respiratory viruses, it is flu, it is COVID, and winter ordinarily that's kind of requiring us to think very differently about how we will manage all of our beds activity, and particularly how we'd manage the needs of children. Because most of you remember that in both waves we had. Um, closed our children's ward to children's admissions 
and, and any child that required a, 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 a long admission um, was cared for by our partners at, um, at the Royal London who helped us out. So that's part of the, the issue that we've got to try and manage because we probably recognise now that's not necessarily going to be um, as simple and straightforward as it was um, in previous waves. Thank you. I can see Malcolm. Just before I come to Malcolm, can I just check any members' uh, questions? Councillor Adams, and then I'll bring you in, Malcolm. Uh, can you please summarise, if possible, what you are doing on building back uh, the elective care? Where, uh, where are you, and uh, what are the main obstacles and timeline? I couldn't hear all of that, Ben. Sorry. It was it was elective care in terms of building back on elective care. No, but it's a microphone. And can sorry, it's pretty hard to pick up in the chamber. Any other members before I bring a council August Camley, and then I'll come to Malcolm. Uh, update on patients admitted with long COVID symptoms. Has there been any change over the last few weeks? Long COVID. Uh, and Malcolm, do you want to go for your question? My question has already been asked just now. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, building back on elective care and long COVID. Right. Okay. So um, and and and. Claire um, walks on the course, so she might be able to help if there's more specific questions on elective care. So, um, all, all organisations were, were expected um, uh, in the autumn of last year to start their um, elective recovery programme, so trying to get to a better position regarding all those cancellations. And we've been working uh, through that, and we've been working across North East London um, to ensure that we're um, making available as much capacity as we possibly can. Um, it's meant for us changes around um, one of our wards to try and make sure that we can take through um, a significant amount of day case activity um, and getting uh, activity back um, as much as we possibly can, particularly at this um, time of year when we um, are, have got bed availability. Um, and trying to kind of keep on top of all of that. But it's also part of work that we're doing across North East London um, to look at the future of where um, elective care and how we can work more collectively um, for, the, for the population of city and Hackney. Um, long COVID, um, we're not necessarily admitting people with long COVID. Um, there are people who've um, uh, may well have been admitted who then um, on discharge you've still got symptoms and then that gets leads to a diagnosis of long COVID. But long COVID is something that also people are, 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 are being diagnosed with that may well have had relatively minor symptoms of COVID, may not have had a hospital admission. Um, uh, and we are working um, uh, within our, particularly our community services um, with some funding from NHS England on developing a model around long COVID. But, um, we expect to see the numbers of people who require um, interventions around long COVID increase as the numbers of COVID cases um, increase again. Um, and I think Sandra quoted earlier today in something, uh, another meeting about 20, 23% of people with, who've had COVID could be um, later on diagnosed as having long COVID. It is going to be quite a challenge and become, I suppose, one of the new long term conditions that we have to ensure that we're able to be clear on the offer. For, for the public, even if they weren't necessarily our our patients um, in a in a hospital bed sense. Um, John, I've got a question from you. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Catherine. Um, firstly, congratulations on your MBE. Um, Thank well you. Um, and it, it kind of relates to that sort of thing because I was thinking of it, what you're talking about the quality account and I was thinking about staff really because I mean one of the things that's been extraordinary is how well the staff have done and an amazing job they've done but we've also been hearing how exhausted they are um, but I think a lot of us are disappointed about the government pay rise um, but it's also kind of the level of kind of you know the, the, the kind of the, the pressures they're under now um, and also the kind of the staff we're hearing about how is it at the Homerton and how are the staff doing? Um so I think I, I think it's fair to say that um, the health and social care workforce, um, in whatever setting, is tired and exhausted. Um, this has been relentless. I, I think that is is fair to say. We have we have as a as a trust done a lot of work regarding um, our well being support and offer, um, and that's come across in in various ways. We we've done some of the 
kind of you know the niceties of you know Tracy wrote to everybody things like that we've given everybody an extra leave day um, this year but we've also been recognizing that some psychological support people need and and because of the support we get from our own service talk changes they've been doing some specific interventions um, I think genuinely people are really anxious um, about the third wave um, and particularly if um, the freedoms that we now are all going to have result in people not wearing masks, not socially distancing, not being vaccinated and therefore spreading COVID and that having an impact on, on um, uh, the activity in the trust but also on themselves in terms of their, 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 the community in which they, they live. Um, and I think it's something we talk about a lot about how how are our staff, how do we acknowledge what they've been through, and how do we look at how we value them and appreciate them. So, um, one of the things that I we we've set up from a um, a nursing and midwifery point of view is a new set of awards. And in fact, next week the first set of awards get get given out to a nurse and midwife and a community nurse that have been nominated by by the organisation. So we're trying to also recognise that how much and how much that um helps people feel better about how they deliver their job how well they've done and and, and actually that they're appreciated because i think we all we all like to be appreciated and that in itself can be quite a good morale boost um but yes lots but, of but, just building on that Kevin, where are you then on sort of the staff um feedback questionnaire because I, I know that was something i think at my time on the governors that was regularly uh, i think brought yearly i mean it, it, are those extra efforts you've been making that you've just gone through is that coming back in sort of hard results uh, in perhaps quite a crude way to judge it in, in sort of the staff feedback and whether they're satisfied or not and then also another thing that i'm obviously aware of is the staff appraisals was sometimes something that always fell below i think the national benchmark average I can appreciate on one side, on one hand, it could be said that it's a very hard year to focus upon that. But on another hand, it could be said it was even more important to focus on that. So, where are you on on feedback from staff and also staff appraisals? Uh, right. So, um, so, the staff survey uh, that was completed, so the staff data collection was uh, quarter three of last year, so before Christmas. We, we've had those results um, and um, you know there are some services where I think staff are still expressing some concerns about you know their experience in the organization and there are some parts of the organization where there's been definite improvement um, what we have what we have been able to show though is that as an organization the culture that we've created around our focus on patient safety equality is some of the best either in London or nationally so there are aspects of how we are working with our staff and the organisation that we're improving. And there are some aspects where we need to do better. And so we've brought in some resource to support that. Um, and then linked to that, actually, the staff survey uh, questions for last year didn't include questions about appraisal, which they have historically. But what we, um, we have, um, as you know, been struggled with getting appraisal rates to a level that have been sustained at you know, the high 80s, 90%. Um, and they did drop off uh, through the uh, through pandemic understandably what we have done is we've reviewed the process of appraisal the documentation um, and how easy it is to record that somebody's had an appraisal because part of the feedback was that was a barrier to knowing whether or not one had been completed and that went live um, in the last few weeks so we ha are hoping we'll see the rewards of that by increased uptake there is also then something about the quality of that appraisal we need to assess and then changes within all NHS organizations that moving away from what used to be called the staff friends and family test to a quarterly um, I suppose more of a temperature check um, which we've all got to implement and we will be implementing that and I think the data collection period for our staff starts uh, middle of this month so we will start to get much more um, uh, current data on the staff experience the, the annual report it takes too long to get the staff survey out and back that kind of we've moved on but this process will hopefully give us much more real-time information right. thank you are there any more questions from um, uh, members oh, okay councillor adams no, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> um, why the name change of name of the holiday 
what was, can you just tell us what that was about? Or changing the name? Yes. <laughs> right, well, I suppose it, um, it, in lots of ways, it was a long time coming, the consideration. Um, uh, the, the Homerton services are not just about the hospital. As important as the hospital is to, to the community and to the needs of patients, that the Homerton provides uh, services across the community, across into the city, um, in, in people's homes, and, and very much felt that we needed a, a name that reflected that, but also um, reflection of actually the, the place we want to hold ourselves as having that kind of anchor organisation and leadership within the city and Hackney Place. Um, so that was the rationale. Um, I think our community services would say it shouldn't have taken 10 years for you to consider that, which is how long they had been part of the organisation. Okay, thank you. Um, unless uh, I've got one last question, I think, from Malcolm, and then I will um, bring this item to a close. Yeah, it's, we'll it, it, ben, it, it's not a question, it's just I just want to tell the committee that, that Stuart Maxwell, who is one of our long term governors, has died very recently. Oh my god, we didn't know that. He was, meeting, so it, he was a regular contributor here as well. Homerton, he was in the Homerton for, for, for a few weeks, but uh, a very sad news. Well, thank you, Lone. I'm very sad to hear that. Very sad to hear that. And he was also a member of the um, uh, member of the governors at the Hamilton. Um, thank you. Thanks for informing us, Michael. Um, on that um, sad note, I'm going to bring this item um, to a close. Thank you, Catherine, um, for coming and for your contribution um, and for all the work the Hamilton's doing. Um, I think we're going to have to see where we obviously go to. And it may be um, that we either call upon you or Tracy for a, um, a, a COVID update at some point um, heading into the winter. And of course, I think something you alluded to there that we're picking up with Tracy and other things is, is the extent to which the Homerton works with partners and maybe elective care is, is rejuggled across the, um, across the patch is certainly something we'll be wanting to pick up in the future. But I'll, I'll close you off there. Thank you very much, Catherine. Yes. Don't feel like I'm you're going to leave you. Thank yeah, you. Please, please do. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Bye bye. Um, can I now go to then item number um, uh, six? We, th this is the future plans for the St. Leonard site. We're joined by Claire Hogg, who, um, forgive me if I truncate your title di to Director of Strategy at the, um, at the Homerton. Um, now, Claire is, I think, speaking at a, a meeting coming up with Health Watch. Um, with respect to the St. Leonard's site. This is a sort of only a 15 or 20 minute item, so it's not, not designed to go on for too long, but it's to give us some feel as to what may be coming down the line. I think pre-COVID, there was discussions with David Mayer getting some seed money from the Cabinet Office to possibly work up some plans. COVID came along, and we haven't really had an update since. And obviously there's the public meeting, so thank you to Health Watch for bringing this back on the agenda and fulfilling your, um, your your important role in doing that. So, Claire, could you just give us some um, introduction and then I'll open up for questions. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, yes, so um, I um, sit on the St. Leonard's Project Group, which actually Malcolm and John are also um, members of. And that project group has been running for some time, pre, pre my joining the Homerton uh, in March last year. Um, and which was essentially overseeing the work that Attain were um, commissioned to do. Uh, so some of the funding that David Mayer and others had secured was to um, engage a company called Attain who did some healthcare and demand analysis on St. Leonard's Hospital. That was concluded at the beginning of 2020, but because of COVID, things really hadn't moved forward a great deal. Um, and that piece of work really sort of sets out the fact that um, I think something that we, a lot of us already know is that St. Leonard's as, an, as a building is old and requires quite a considerable amount of investment in order to make it fit for purpose in the long term. And that we have a number of healthcare services that are being delivered from that site. Um, if you look at, they did a piece of demand analysis work, which essentially identified that we would start to run out of space unless we looked differently about how those services were being provided. Um, one of the uh, things that we have talked about in um, this project group is that the piece of work that Attain did, it did include some public engagement, what was quite minor, and Health Watch um, were really keen to 
start a piece of work around public engagement. And I've essentially been supporting them um, with that um, and working with Health Watch to think about as as a, as a the city and Hackney system, how do we ensure that we are going to be working together to create a vision for St Leonard's that really engages the public in what the future of St Leonard's should look like. So we're really committed as a, as a um, health system with our partners to think about how does St Leonard's become really an anchor institution in, within City and Hackney. Um, how can we use that facility and that site to address population health need, the social determinants of health? We want it to be more than a healthcare facility. So how can it we build a vision for that site that addresses uh, and offers opportunities around education, employment, potentially housing? So the, this piece of work with um, Health Watch is really the beginning of that public engagement process to help us to create and shape a vision for St Leonard's, which will then enable us to start to build on um, a business case for the development of the site. Thank you, Claire. Um, just before then, I, I bring in um, uh, colleagues. I think I've got certainly um, Councillor Adams is a councillor uh, for that area. Um, can I just, in terms of timescales, then? So you've got this. You've got the bit of work from Attain, which sort of the, it was de delayed because of COVID, understandably. You're now helping to facilitate a public outreach work in terms of consultation. What's the next stage in terms of, if possible, to unlock further funding or agreement from property services at NHS to then move forward to say with a, I think what would require a greater release of funding to work up a complete business case. What's the timeline are we looking at? Um, so really that's the piece of work that we need to be doing over the next six to 12 months in terms of really creating that vision uh, in order to think about what are the various sources of funding that are available. In terms of the, t the time scale for the total St. Leonard's development, uh, we do have a drive time timeline that we've put together. Um, it's been led primarily with some support through um, Siobhan's team, which would see aim to have a St. Leonard's redevelopment in 2026. Um, and that's a, we're, one of the things we're really keen that we do in this public engagement event is be clear about you know, we are talking about a long term program of work and we are talking about. Uh, and we want to and are very keen to continue to engage with the, the public throughout that whole um, programme. And is the money still available? So if I recall correctly, there was possibly one of five hospitals either, or five sites either across London or the country that, that from the, in part of this cabinet office programme, or am I, am I is, the, is, that, is that money through that scheme still possibly ring-fenced and available? I'm, I'm not aware that that is the case. Siobhan might have more information on that, but I'm not aware that that's the case. Well, then let me just rephrase it. Whoever gave us the money for the attain study, <laughs> can we go back to them for more? Where, where, that, 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 that possible pool of money that might yes, be available to do it. So one of the, we actually had a St. Leonard's project meeting today, and we did talk about OPE, who were the uh, enabled us to... Um, supported us with the finances for the attain program so they are there is still a possibility to go back to them around funding and what they are looking for from us is to uh, a very clear vision and strategy for the redevelopment of the site and one that is very much um a system vision uh, is agnostic to the issue around ownership so really that's that's the next stage of the program i think that they want to see something from us about what is it we want to do with St. Leonard's, and i think we can then reopen those conversations about potential funding and what does op stand for who are they one public estate and that's what part of part of the department of health or um, no i understand it's part of a kind of a broader kind of public they're very keen on social housing um, so I think that's it's broad, it's beyond health. Okay, fine. Okay, right. I've got I I, I could okay, but let's count to Adam. But it's his, um, it's his ward. So and then I'll come to that. Yes, thank you for the update. Uh, my, I live very close to the site. Uh, I'm just wondering uh, uh, about the uh, public meeting coming up. How is it advertised? Because most people living around here don't know about this meeting. And my second question is that is there going to be a consultation with the local people? Uh, regarding any decision you come to, what do I want to do with the site? Okay, did you catch that? Uh, yes, yeah, so, so in terms of the question around publication of the event, um, I will ask Malcolm and John to 
pick up on that. That's something they've been leading on. The second question was it around public consultation. Yeah, yeah consultation, but particularly perhaps more just thinking about the very local community, the people who surround the site. So I think, in other words, leaflet drops, perhaps in different languages. So you're really, you're not to say just relying yeah. on Twitter yeah. feeds or yeah. Facebook, but really outreaching for that, that those local people. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's one of the things that we've been talking to Health Watch about how we can start to create an engagement plan but also where do we get uh, identify some resources to help us to do that and one of the things that and Malcolm and John might want to touch on it is that part of the engagement plan is, is this is a, a long-term piece of work they're very committed not just to to working with the local community and thinking about how we work through the neighborhood program as well um, so uh, and that's something we've with agreed we're going to work on together to make sure we get the public um, engagement for the local community. I think we're really clear that we need to be working with the community around St Leonard's as well as recognising that that's all, it's also a facility for the whole of City of Hackney. So we want to make sure we're, we're addressing both of those points. Okay. Uh, would it be possible to, uh, for the uh, local councillors to have a meeting with you just to uh, get an update? I'm, I'm one of the councillors here, yeah, three of us. So, would that be possible to have uh, an update uh, with you for an update? Did you catch that, Claire? Yeah, so it's possible to meet with... The, the local council, sorry, the acoustics are very bad in the hall, in the room here. To meet with the local councillors, um, because of course you've got the local councillors around there who are quite tied in with, with, yes, with, with yes, their, yes. their communities. Yeah. Absolutely, and we that's actually something that we discussed recently about how we're going to make sure we engage with a broader group of stakeholders um, through our engagement plan, so we can, we can uh, arrange to do that. Yeah, it's, it's something I think we can maybe facilitate with Jarlis and uh, Councillor Adam to uh, put you in touch. Uh, Malcolm. Uh, I think John will deal with the communications part of it, but I, I mean, I, 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 I mean, I think Claire has put, put very well what what, what, the, what the plan is. Um, just to sort of add that, that you know what we're thinking about is is what we've called the people's plan, and, and we want to involve as many people as possible across across uh, City and Hackney to to participate in in the, in the development of that plan. So the you know we want we want to really release people's ideas about about how they see how they see the uh, the, the, the hospital developing. I mean, we, we, you know, we, 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 we're sort of very much focused on calling it St. Evans Community Hospital because we think that that's a sort of really important development. But we will be using a variety of different techniques to, to, to involve people. So we will be trying all sorts of ways to make sure that as many people as possible are, are involved in this process. So that meet, so the first meeting is on the 13th of, of July and that will be online. And then we will also, we've invited Diane Abbott to speak to our AGM on the 28th of July on the same subject. So uh, yeah, there's a lot going on, and, and I think the way in which we're working collectively on this is is very positive. The the um, collective work sounds uh, uh, very well and very positive. I mean, but just I mean, just putting a financial hat on and putting sort of and how you're going to get the money and whether you're looking at sort of like a whips cross deal with the treasury to persuade them or, or Propco to persuade them to to actually unleash some of the money. I mean, it would just knowing how these things operate, you're going to. You, if you wanted it to even try and wash its face financially, you might be having to say to them it was private sale of, say, 50%, I don't know, um, for social good, of however that was termed, hospital site, maybe some key worker housing, maybe a nursery, et cetera, et cetera, um, for the other 50%. So I suppose, are you, being devil's advocate, are you at risk of possibly setting unrealistic expectations amongst the community unless you, 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 you level with them at quite an early stage as to how these deals are financially structured, as it were? And so is that something that you're having to make people aware of at this early stage? I think that um, it's essential that we make people aware that, that you know, we want to open up people's visions on, on what, what, what can be created, um, but we have to be honest with people that this is a long-term project and some of these projects fail because, you know, some of the parties pull out or the resources aren't there. But, but there's a very important thing, which is, I think, the having... Um, great support from across City and Hackney for this for this development is going to be very important, I think, in releasing funds. So I think uh, you know we, we want everybody to be sort of really committed to this project so that so that it is a success. But are you? I mean, and maybe sort of um, 
I mean, Claire, I mean, are you are you raising it with people um, that there would have to be some sort of financial trade off? Possibly, it would presumably have to go via the Treasury for a site of that value, I would have thought, as I think Phipps Cross site did. So are, are, are you entering into discussion that there might need to be some private sale of or development of that site to facilitate social good? Um, we haven't talked about doing that explicitly at the engagement event next week, but we, we absolutely will have to do that. This was the engagement event for next week is very much the kind of start of that process. Um, but what we did want to talk to people about was recognising that, that the facility um, is not, we, we don't want it just the, that, not just the St. Lentz Hospital itself, the whole site, that there are opportunities that we can look at around housing, around things like nurseries, um, and really to try to engage with the community about, well, what, what would you want um, so that we can build that into our thinking? And also then, you know, the negotiations we do need to do with the, when it comes to the financial side of the um, development. And just out of interest, is it is the site in the same structural place that Whips Cross was, as in owned by NHS Property Services, I think? So is it, is it almost directly analogous? And I, I mean, from what I know, of, if I recall correctly, of the Whips Cross site, there's still gaps or so there were at certain stages in, in, in budgetary areas, but there was an agreement that it would go ahead. And, and it is going ahead. So have you got there now? I appreciate Whips Cross will, um, uh, people have mixed feelings about that. And I don't want to sort of get into the rights or wrongs of that. But have you got there a sort of template if you wanted to, to uh, make a financial case to property services or the treasury? Yeah, so I think there are a couple of um, examples across North East London we can use uh, to think about different kind of financial models. So. Um, the property St Leonard's is uh, currently is in the ownership of NHS property services. One of the things that we are considering as a system is whether that um, facility could be transferred to um, a party, which would be the Homerton. Um, but there's a very long process to go through uh, mm -hmm. for to, to transfer the assets. Um, and that's happened in um, another part of uh, North East London. So at St George's Hospital in Hornchurch, that's happened and there's been a development. So there's, a, I think there's a couple of models that we can look at, um, either WIPs or the St George's model. I think the thing about the expression of interest and the um, transfer of the asset is that is again, it will take some time. So what we don't want to do is we need to run those two processes in parallel. We can't have do one and then the other, right? It's just gonna delay Things. So we need to run those things together at the same time. Great, thank you. And I can see John. I'll bring John in. I mean, the only other thing: are there any other councillors that have got um, they've got questions? I mean, you, you've mentioned housing area. I mean, it always strikes me, and I think I think there might be some on the Whips Cross site, but I, I forget. Do you know to have genuine key worker housing, perhaps for hospital staff, um, it's both a real opportunity and also I think a real selling point for something if you can genuinely build that in um particularly for that sort of demographic that's priced out of the borough uh and you know all the reasons why it's important to you know to be able to work and live environmental better for people's um less travel and what have you um so that was just more comment really um john I'll, I'll i'll go to you and then finish off this item thanks ben uh just want to say a bit about the co-production process that we're involved in this is been driven by the City and Hackney Co-Production Charter. So that's kind of very clear about that we're very honest with the people about what, what money's available and what, what, how we're going to operate. And this is kind of a long-term process that we're involved in. So it's going to take years to actually get through this. So again, it's about having that conversation with the public and helping them understand about how things operate. That's what co-production's about. It's about kind of having a proper honest conversation and everybody's kind of clear about it. And we're all committed to that and we're, that's what we'll do. Um, and it's, it'll be, I think it'll be a kind of a, it's, it's an exciting project and that's what we need to be focusing on rather than kind of saying it's all going to be difficult it will be challenging we know it's challenging we started we started in a challenging place but it is a very exciting project it's a way of actually kind of making people feel optimistic about things because they're not feeling very optimistic about things at the moment so i think it's a really good opportunity to show how co-production works in the borough but also shows how we can all work together for the common good for everybody um, thanks john um, claire thanks very much um, for joining us and explaining where you're at um, I'm just checking there's no one else there. Um, I'll bring this item to a close. I mean, I think obviously the meetings are going on. It may be 
at the point where you are working up more of a, or maybe you've just submitted a more of a firm proposal in terms of it might be an appropriate point to bring you back to sort of hear what some of the um, um, suggestions are. So I think this is clearly something that will engender a lot of local interest going forward. And so if we could, uh, at the appropriate point, have sort of an update on, on where we are, that'd be great. But thanks very much for coming today and uh, thanks for the update. So uh, with that, I will bring that item to a close and then we'll go on to item number um, seven, which is the Health Watch Annual Report. Um, we're joined uh, by John and by uh, Malcolm, um, the Chief Exec and um, the Chair. So I don't know who wishes to kick off. John, do you want to kick off or Malcolm? I'll, I'll, I'll kick off and then John will take over. Okay. Um, okay. So obviously from our point of view as Health Watch, it's been a bit tough over the past sort of uh, 18 months or so because communication for us is, is central in terms of of how we influence our local services, but but hearing uh, for us to hear the voice of local people now is is, is absolutely fundamental. And so we've ch we've changed the way in which we've done things uh, in in Health Watch. For example, our board meetings, which were very kind of I suppose governance uh, bureaucratic meetings, have now sort of changed. So we have key speakers, and recently over the past uh, year, we've had uh, Claire has spoken, and Murray Gabriel, Paul Kalimanas, and, and Anne Canning. So we we've tried to sort of change the the way in which we we relate to the public. So all those meetings are open, so the public can can participate and, and challenge. We've also introduced Introduced uh, a model because we can't do the interim view um, uh, visits that we used to do for monitoring. We've now sort of introduced what we call the information exchange, where we have speakers and we have the public coming along um, online, obviously, and, and and having quite detailed discussions about some really key issues. So, so one of them recently was about the. Um, um, registration with general practitioners and I think you've probably seen the the registration report which rather sadly showed that 75 percent of local GPS were not complying with the, with, with the rules in relation to um, the registration of patients and this particularly impacted on people who who were asylum seekers or people who who were not uh, formally registered in, ter in terms of their status um, so and we and so that's been a very important opportunity to, to raise this issue. Um, and it's had a sort of great impact, I think, and, and, this, and we've worked very closely with the CCTG on, on, on this matter as well. So those, those, are, those are some of the issues. And, and, and just one other thing I mentioned before John comes in is that we also want to be much more public facing. I mean, I mean, we, we talk about a lot about St. Leonard's, but there we are stuck inside St. Leonard's. Our office is, is so remote for the public. And, and our ambition for the next year is to actually have a, a public office where we can clearly be seen, where people contact us much more easily, and they know that, that, you know, that, that our central theme is to use a public voice to change and improve local services. Over to you, John. Okay, uh, I've, got a I've got a presentation. Do you want me to share that? Or yeah, if you can. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Right. Okay, right. Okay, um, so, so this is our report, and I'm going to spend much time on this. Uh, okay, so the overview of the year. Um, so, as Malcolm said, uh, COVID really reshaped our work with residents. We were suddenly, you know, one of the key things for us is that we're there to actually kind of be face to face with people, talk to people, listen to their concerns. That all stopped essentially uh, in March last year, uh, and we had to go and kind of go online. Uh, and that kind of concerned us because it, we, it separated us from uh, people who are not so uh, much online, the digital divide that we hear so much about. So that's been a kind of continuing concern of us. Um, we know the impact of COVID is still unfolding. We've heard a lot about that today, particularly about long COVID and the impact on young people. Um, we think this is something we really need to keep an eye on. We're very pleased about the Homerton having a long COVID in place. We're very pleased about the way public health have been engaging with the population through community health champions to kind of promote vaccines as well. So, but it's a, still a long way to go on that. Um, we're concerned that satisfaction with the health and service, care services continues to slip. I'll say a bit more about that later. Um, as we all know, integrated care is arriving. It's been arriving for a long time. It continues to arrive and it's still reshaping itself as it goes along in that process. So I think it's really important that the integrated care is really part of the community. So again, I think we're kind of quite focused on governance again. 
that will stop and the work of the uh, integrated care will start. And that's where it's really important that we get the public involved in that. Um, Malcolm's mentioned uh, health options need to be more accessible. We're in St. Leonard's, you can't get in to see us at the moment. It's not good. We need to be, we need to be in the shop fronts. We need to be much more accessible for people when they can access us. us. So uh, just a couple of slides on what we do. I'm not really going to spend much time on this because you're familiar with these because I showed them to you every year. Um, but essentially, as, as you can see, you know, we're about really making sure people can monitor and making sure we can get people's views, making sure that people are really kind of involved in the commissioning and scrutinizing of public health, health services. As uh, so Malcolm mentioned, we publish reports and make recommendations. I'll mention a few of those uh, later on. We provide advice and information to people, and it's, it continues to be a big issue for us that uh, signposting is a major issue that we have to do. Uh, there's a real challenge in our community to actually for people to really understand about the services that are there. Um, and finally, we formulate views of the standard of local services as well, and, uh, and uh, share those with Health Watch England and the CQC. Right. Um, in terms of what residents told us in the last year, um, that there's a trend of being less satisfied. That's perhaps not surprising because life's become very much more difficult. So we've seen an eight percent drop. Uh, so there's kind of a, a, there's a grind going on. So it's really um, kind of you know, kind of undermining the, those services, and that's not surprising given the fact we still live with austerity uh, and the various problems we have. Um, in terms of uh, what residents told us, in terms of kind of how uh, they felt less informed and supported or involved, that's that's quite concerning because you know, and in some ways it's understandable. Pandemic closed everything down, so it's not surprised people felt less informed and involved. But it's kind of it, it is concerning. It's a big drop, but we we would hope to see a reverse in that fairly soon. Please see the Hamilton managed to get a two percent increase. You know, in spite of all the difficult challenges they had this year, uh, they managed to kind of you know with we call it an increase and the surgeries also have maintained their position which again has been a real struggle for them and it's okay appreciate all the work that they've been doing to john but if the homerton has gone up gp surgeries remain the same what do the what in your view do the top two what are the what are people feeding back about when they feel less satisfied if it's not the homerton and the gps well, it's it's whilst there's satisfaction increase, that's kind of the quality of it. What what people are less satisfied about is the kind of communication and the administration of these services. So what? So the I'm, I'm talking the, the satisfaction rates in terms of kind of you know what people are kind of you know, the quality of the services they're okay. It, they're they're stable. They're stable, and that, but that's what people tell us. They're impressed with the quality. They're impressed with the staff. But what they're not so impressed with is the kind of the administration, communications, access to services. And the just general administration getting letters out of people, all that sort of stuff. So that's where the, that's where the kind of the, the pressure on the services seems to be, and that's where they need to probably think about what they should be investing in. They seem to they seem to be doing a very good job in terms of quality. Um, what they also told us about, as I just mentioned, the compassionate treatment and care. That's really kind of comes out kind of comes out clear about us. Uh, there's an increase in uh, complaints about service access. Perhaps not again surprising given what the challenges that we all saw last year. And as I just mentioned, it's communication and administration is a key resident concerns. This will kind of consistently be an area that we need to kind of see, see if we can see some improvements about. And out of interest, sorry to interrupt you again, John, is the, is the administration, I mean, I hear frequently back administration at Barts as, as like a key, a key repeated complaint i don't hear it as much about the homerton is that a, a delineation you pick up on well no i'd, I'd say homerton does get uh, still does get some complaints but it mainly does kind of fall down on the administration and the communication um it's maybe not as bad as parts i can't say how bad, bad parts is but um mm -hmm. it is kind of it's it's a similar sort of issues i think for for both of them really um so just in terms of our volunteers, uh, so we've got 41 volunteers. That's been great this year that we've had all those people involved. That confused our board, who've been very active. Um, again, they've given us a huge contribution in terms of the hours. You see, over 3,000 hours, um, and they, they kind of they remain a major backbone of what we do. Kind of contacting people, helping us produce reports, um, and hopefully one day start getting involved in events again. So we continue, as I mentioned, kind of signposting, so helping people find the answers. With, we had real limits, major limit on the service today, because one of the way, main ways you do signposting is we go, go, go out, meet people. They, we, we talk to them and we find out what they don't know really. Um, so we haven't been able to do that. So the signposting has not been as major issues uh, service this in the last year, and I think that's something we want to push on in this coming year. Um, our business area has been really contacting the people with co uh, around COVID, um, and what we've been seeing there really is mental health needs increases. Um, pressure on carers 
uh, particularly with those dealing with people with mental health problems and disability. Um, and also parents found uh, homeschool a real challenge as well. So trying to juggle everything has been a real issue for people as well. Um, and I think we've also kind of been pleased, we did a review of the uh, complaints charter this year with the Health and Wellbeing Board. And uh, particularly Mark has been doing great, some great work with GP and dentists and extending the charter to the two uh, more groups within the, uh, within the borough. Uh, we give voice to residents on various issues, uh, like I said, the COVID, COVID survey we talked about in our annual report. That's, I think the key thing that kind of worried me about that survey was the way people are beginning to just trust their institutions, even local institutions, much more now. Um, and that's something we do have to recover. And that's why I think things like St. Leonard's is so important. It's about kind of building up people's confidence in their institutions again. We did a report on temporary accommodation with shelter. Um, Please about the council's response to that. But it's a, this is a kind of a key area. We know the council has a lot of challenges here, but it's a really important area that we see important changes in because you know people are stuck in this place. They're having long; t it has long-term effect on them. So it's really important that we can improve those places. Um, we talked to carers about their experiences, and, they, and again, we think that their voices are very important at the moment because you know when you know. And through austerity and now the pandemic, they have been heavily leaned on and they are in lots of ways beginning to atomize in front of us. So we need to be really supportive of them. Um, the access to dental services, we picked up very clearly the dental services were struggling um, and continue to struggle. Try, trying to get to see a dentist is not an easy thing to do at the moment. Um, we had a very good meetings uh, last year on dental services and this has become a national issue through uh, Health Watch England as well uh, because a number of other health watches have picked it up. We have we were pleased about the engagement that we had from the London lead, the commissioning uh, Jeremy Warman from the, the uh, NHS England. We did a report on GP receptionists, uh, which has been, uh, was, uh, well, I think GP receptionists probably found it a bit of a challenge. But again, this is about the communication issues and, and the administration. These are the sort of issues that we found there. Um, Information exchange meetings have been Malcolm, men, mentioned by Malcolm. These have been really powerful for us. We have held them monthly. We've had really good meetings on vaccines, on uh, kind of registration of GPs and other issues. And Malcolm's mentioned these public board meetings already. So in terms of building the future of public involvement, I've mentioned the co-production charter. That's been renewed at the moment. As we feel it's very important that uh, may, we may be stuck in the world of rhetoric around co-production. We need to kind of start moving into the practice of co-production and making sure that it really is the way that we do things in the city and Hackney. Um, integrated care is a key issue for us, in the, as, as for everybody else in the in the in the borough. Um, we are pushing, and we. And I'm very pleased to say that there's very lot of support within integrated care about public involvement. Uh, we're building, I think, up a really good system that's well respected and also kind of seen by North East London as a kind of a way to go in terms of kind of public involvement. So we should be very pleased what we're doing there. But I think it's, it's always kind of going to be a tough piece of work. Um, neighbourhoods and primary care networks are kind of uh, an area that we're also working with and we do want to see uh, the neighbourhoods as well as the primary care to be really engaged with the public and so we were involved in a particularly good piece of work that the PCN down in Shoreditch Park uh, managed to get funding from primary care for with uh, Health of City that's really been engaged with people very well with over a thousand people engaging in that piece of work so it's, it's, it's a very it's, that seems to be coming come to come together now we continue to operate the community voice uh project that did the covid um report and a conscious of time so i'm gonna yeah i'll ask you just to wind up thanks john yeah okay and uh, these are our finances which you already have so i'm not going to go through them um okay i'm gonna stop sharing now you can ask this question thank you thanks john that's very helpful um, in terms of all the things you've been doing uh Councillor Snell. uh thank you my apologies for the meeting for being uh late i'm uh away on care duties uh, with my um, mum and uh, it took a while to get up here. But anyway, I'm with the meeting now. Uh, I was interested, John, in whether you could just go through the relationship between yourself um, and uh, the Confederation. And my particular area of interest at the moment is I continue to do a small amount of VAX volunteer work. And we're kind of trying to understand why more people aren't booking appointments through their GPs and I'm often on the front desk saying oh it's really easy to get through you just ring your GP up in the morning etc etc people are saying well that doesn't really happen in practice and I know that that's in the confed contract and I just wonder how are we checking particular areas of that contract because it would seem to me that you would be the obvious person 
to go through the areas possibly like that that uh, are supposed to we're supposed to, they're supposed to be doing do they do their shopping can they get you to do the mystery shopping because it really does worry me when people say things that i know should happen aren't happening uh, thanks councillor snell uh yes thank you uh, yeah. We, we had done some kind of mystery shopping. We did that with the dental piece of work that we did recently. Um, and I think we've worked, we are probably thinking, and we did it also with the um, part of the work around the GP registration was kind of some mystery shopping there as well. Um, and I think we'll probably be doing it again. And I would happily work with Laura to kind of make sure that we kind of make sure that the services are accessible. Um, I mean, we hear that they're kind of people are, are struggling, but I mean, we're not hearing a huge noise about that at the moment. Because that's some, that's, I mean, I think City and Hackney seem to be a, a, a quite a strong primary care system compared to other areas. My own area, for example, is much more challenging in the in Northern Forest. Um, so I, th I, I would work, would be happy to work with her, Laura to kind of find out more about that. Maybe that's a conversation I should pursue with her. But I know she's extremely busy now at the moment. <laughs> Um, any other questions from um, members, Councillor Adams? No. <laughs> oh, the, the wave will happen. Um, can I just ask? I mean, obviously, as you've alluded to, John, the um, there's a merging of systems with the ICS. The health watches are still very borough based. Um, what scope is there? What financing is there? What plans are there to? provide a health watch function over an ICS footprint. Now, whether that be you reallocate some of your existing resource, it would pooled with others for a member of staff, say, that does that, or whether you do it on rotation basis, whether you ask for more funding for it, I don't know. But do you think there's a gap there? Well, it's, it's, that's an interesting question, because, I mean, it's a conversation we're pursuing with uh, Nell CCG at the moment. Um, we've, we've the first piece of work we've been pursuing, pursuing with them is the uh, introduction of the Community Insight database, which they're starting to use as a way of actually managing uh, kind of public uh, views on health and care. Um, and we did a major piece of work for them in the last few months around kind of gathering data, uh, which I think we've got over 600 uh, surveys back from disabled people across NEL. And essentially, that's been a piece of work that we've kind of demonstrated the use of the uh, Community Site Insight database. And we want to intend to enhance, enhance that piece of work with NEL CCG. Um, and they're probably going to be funding uh, what they call the platinum model of that, which is essentially kind of um, putting money to make sure they can produce uh, reports and data and actually hold data for across the system. We also want to make, be making sure that we start putting in data from all the hospitals. So we start putting, putting aggregating all that into it as well so it actually creates a baseline so that's one piece of work we're doing with nel ccg at the moment they were also asking us to go to lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of meetings um and uh, we're kind of we're saying back to them that this, that's not feasible for us so we're talking begin to talk to them about how we're going to do that and that may be uh, them either financing somebody for us to do all those meetings for us or them funding us in some way to actually allow us to have the capacity to, to go to those meetings but i mean i, I think yeah from our conversation with Nell CCG and the health watchers are meeting Marie Gabriel on Monday again, because we meet her on a quarterly basis along with Henry Black as the principal, of, as the accountable officer. Um, is that you know that they continue to kind of want to be public involvement for key area of development for Nell CCG, and they want to work closely with the health watchers on that. So um, I think they're having a, a positive relationship with it at the moment. Um, but I also think we just need to kind of uh, we need to kind of keep pushing so we have the capacity to make sure public involvement really works across NEL CCG and also in Sydney and Hackney. I think, yeah. I think I think we continue to want to make sure that people understand that public involvement isn't a nice to have. It's a vital component to transformation. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, do, just speaking from a personal capacity, I mean, I think I would value at times with say the new restructure going on just looking at it from a northeast london capacity your sort of objective eye at times as to well hang on what 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 could be missing here from governance if it's the case say that on the new ics board there's only one local authority lead um and it's dealing with seven or eight local authorities that's possibly a massive gap and also could have significant ramifications depending upon the demographics and priorities of the local authority where that person is based so it, it, it's all of that sort of analysis and understanding as it's going on and I, certainly i just speaking on a personal level i think i i would feel um and i think we as councillors would feel 
more assisted in our ability to scrutinize if there was sort of like a joined up health watch explainer objective analysis about the these changes as they're going along because that then aids our understanding our, and our ability to challenge so that's just my sort of uh, request as it were or to comment i see malcolm's raised his hand and then yes I just just, just quickly i mean it is um, there is a major funding problem here unfortunately um if, if you look at the amount of money which is allocated by government for health watch and the amount of money they actually get from from our local council um there is quite a, quite a lot of money is lost on that journey and i think that's a real problem for us about working on a, a northeast london level yeah i think i'm aware of the um I think I understand the, the sort of the, the figures that are being referred to there, Malcolm. And, that, and, that, and that's maybe a a question. Councillor Kennedy's not with us tonight, um, and or I don't know whether that would fit under Helen's um, jurisdiction. But I mean, just to, just to understand what their response to that is, and so that's maybe something we can um, we can take forward. So I, I don't know what their answer to that is. Okay, then, unless there's anything else from members looking around, no, I will bring. This item to a close. Thank you very much, um, uh, John and Malcolm, for all your work. Um, it's obviously been a difficult year in terms of how you engage normally, but I think we always we always find your input incredibly valuable um, on many different levels. So th thank you very much uh, for the work that you do. Thank you. So the, the last item um, then that we have now is in relation to the secondary use of GP data. This is. Uh, very much a national issue about whether people uh, opt out or don't of their GP records being passported on to national government onto a central database. Um, our colleagues in Tower Hamlets, a number of the GPs have said they're refusing to pass that data on. In the agenda pack is a um, helpful article, a very brief article um, behind tab eight explaining some of the arguments uh, for and against and the concerns with this, even though the data is anonymized. Grateful to Siobhan and Mark, um, who's our clinical chair um, for City and Hackney, um, for being here. Um, could one of you, I don't know who's going to start off, just give some sort of introduction to this, and obviously where we are. I mean, obviously we've got colleagues over in Tower Hamlets that seem to be taking a far more robust view than perhaps we are at the moment. What's the uh, what's your view? Uh, well, uh, thanks, Ben. I said I'd, I'd kick this off. Um, one of the the key people who you refer to in Tower Hamlets uh, is a GP called uh, Dr. Osman Barty, Barty, who has um, uh, with GPs from the local medical committee uh, in in. Uh, um, Across North East London, in fact, but uh, but but uh, quite a lot within Tower Hamlets, have yeah publicised the the issues here. Osman is also the clinical lead, digital lead for the North East London CCG, and he works within the primary care team at the NEL CCG. So um, uh, it would have been great if he could have come uh, because he's absolutely steeped in this whole issue and could have answered all questions in chapter and verse in terms of the details of the of the of the issues. Unfortunately, couldn't come, so so he sort of sent me a briefing, and I'm I'm, I'm going to try and do it justice. It is what's happening now. We have to remember that at the moment, data is extracted from primary care systems. It's used to you know for all manner of different reasons, from payment and, and all sorts of things. And and actually, uh, practices should, on their websites, at the very least, publicise the, that fact that is happening. And that data is extracted in a pseudonymized way. You, used, you said it's anonymous, but in fact, it's not completely anonymized because you could still extract data by age or sex or other you know, blood pressure because you need to know what the blood pressures are if you're going to, you know, uh, uh, quality outcomes framework is dependent on certain, you know, clinical, uh, achieving certain clinical enough standards of care. So, so it's, it's, but it's not, it, it is, it is, you can't identify the individual from within that, those data sets. What the government is doing are, are going to replace that system with something called the general practice data for planning and research, NHS Digital. Uh, and that's going to require this, this extraction of data, which, which we think is going to be a much more profound kind of data extraction. Now, we're not sure because at the moment, the government haven't really explained fully how the whole system will work. So under the general data 
protection regulations, the GDPR, which we are we have to apply to and all organisations have to. Data controllers in this situation are the practices. The data owners are still the individual patients. The data controllers have responsibility to explain to the data owners, the patients, what data is going to be used for. And that information needs, and, and what the implications of that. And so we're still waiting for the government to publish the data protection impact assessment. Because until you, you can't possibly properly uh, counsel patients until you have that information. Um, so what's the, uh, the, the, the practices have to switch on the data extraction, otherwise the, the, the data cannot be extracted. So um, Osman and colleagues wrote to all GPs saying, you as a data controller have to be, con you have to be convinced that you have been able to tell the patients the use of the data, what's going to happen to it, etc, etc, etc. And that meets your requirements as a data controller. At the moment, we would suggest that you are unable to do that, and therefore we say you're in a position to switch on the data extraction. And that information has gone across all of North East London. And it's not particularly Tower Hamlet's GPs being more um, robust than anyone else. No one's turned it on, partly because they then pushed back the date when they were going to expect it to be turned on to the beginning of September, because nationally there was a huge pushback saying, oh, hang on, what are, you, what are you expecting here? GPs are in a difficult position because the government has made this a contractual requirement that they turn on this data extraction. Now, there isn't as yet any penalties for not doing so, but nonetheless, you will be in breach of your contract. And technically, that has potential consequences. So, but at the moment, you, so, the, you, so the, the data controllers and, and each practice will have a nominated lead data controller, named person, are either going to be in breach of GDPR regulations because they can't explain what the data is going to be used to for their patients, so or they're going to be in breach of their contract because they haven't turned on the extraction. All of which we're waiting for further information from the government to say exactly what's going to happen to this data, how it's going to be used, how it's going to be protected, etc. etc. Because actually, if you do it right, getting data like this is incredibly powerful for research, for organization of care, for all manner of different positive good beneficial stuff and should you know and, and actually you shouldn't be able to identify the individual within it now there's another bit of this which individual data owners patients can say oh you lot get your act well, whilst you're getting your act together i'm going to i'm going to um, opt out two ways of opting out one is a sort of more general opt-out system which is in the opinion of uh, osman and colleagues is isn't good enough because actually you could still upline, um, use the data in various ways. The best way of doing it is to fill in a form, send it to your practice, and say, "Do not accept, do not send up any of my data from source." And opt out. Uh, I think it's called an opt out option one form. That has to be done. Okay, it can be done electronically. Send to the practice. The practice has to pick it up, uh, open the notes, put in a special code. It then blocks data extraction. Massively uh, a laborious administrative task. We're going to do if, if many many thousands of people do that. There is no resources at all practices to employ anyone to do that. Yes. So that, so that you know, at a time when general practice is extraordinarily busy, especially since it's July, uh, when a time which we would expect things to be less busy, but you know we can rehearse all the all the challenges within the whole of the healthcare system, health and care system. Um, that will just add to it so there's a lot of kind of uh, worry practically speaking as well if patients suddenly you know come through in, in large numbers and say right you know code put the code on my notes put my code on my notes before this september date so at the moment the government are promising to do some more communications out to the public that's still awaited osmond and colleagues are going to do some communications out to the public in the coming weeks but at the moment talking to osmond is going it's slightly difficult to know what to say because we, we're, we're, we're still waiting for guidance. And so, when, do we know when that guide, have the, have the government po promised the date when that guidance will be published explaining what the data would be used for? I don't believe so. Not when I last spoke to Osman. So it could come on the 23rd of August when it finished, when the cons <laughs> when the, <laughs> the end date is the 25th of August or something. I, it's very difficult for CCG to advise practice not to switch on the data extraction you know turn on switch because it would be difficult for us to 
condone recommending practices breach their contracts. However, the local medical committee and others uh, aren't similarly bound in, in, by those considerations. And I, and I think at the moment, when the first data deadline was coming off to switch on data extraction, most practices were, were saying, well, of course we can't switch it on. And, and, actually, actually, and if no one does, then, 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 this, then the government will have to, you know. Anyway, that's all speculative. So we'll have to wait. Not, That was a really helpful explanation, Mark. Um, do um, I see Councillor Snell there? Just before I bring um, Councillor Snell in, is this just doctors in sort of um, Tower Hamlet Hackney because of Dr. Osmond's knowledge, who we've actually met before in one of our previous reviews, sort of superior knowledge, or is this going on across the country as well with other areas as well? I believe it's, uh, it's going on all over the place. I mean, I think Osmond is particularly well positioned to do it. I mean, he, he, uh, he wrote stuff uh blogs etc was picked up by national press uh, uh so we have quite a quite kind of interest in it in this area but there are other areas in the country because he, you're absolutely right in your introduction this this is this is relates to all general practice across the country thank you uh, Mark. in england i'm not quite sure whether it's happening in scotland and wales i'm not sure the situation is there, but england yeah councillor snell uh clearly the prospect of um vaccination passports are potentially a huge drive huge driver for people to start downloading the nhs app and using it far more in their relationship with the local health economy uh, what worries me on this and certainly the vaccinators are pushing it hard and we're explaining to people how it works on the volunteer front potentially i mean i think this has to be got right because potentially as i would understand it if, if people were refusing to share their data, then they'd lose out on the NHS app and all that and the other benefits they could get from it. Have I understood that correctly? Or can you be using the NHS app um, and, and yet still refuse to allow your data to be uploaded? Um, I'm not sure, Peter. I, I, I think my understanding is that when uh, somebody receives their vaccine, it gets put onto a system called Pinnacle which I'm sure you would have heard of anyone, you know, it's always been discussed in all the vaccine sites. Oh, Pinnacle's gone down, let's boot it up again. You know, Pinnacle is the system, it works generally very well. Within two or three days, the fact that that vaccination has been administered, you know, the, the, the um, vaccine code number, you know, which arm it went into, etc., all drops into the GP notes. I think it also drops into the app separately. Bob, Bob, it doesn't require them to be extracted out of the GP notes again to go into the app. But, the, but there may be other things that would go from the gp notes you're getting a bit technical there um i mean i think if we get it right we are getting technical there you 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 yes yeah, I'm, I'm at the limits of my technical knowledge they they but you're right you know we do need to get this right because it's a, it, it, this getting it right has a huge kind of force for good <laughs> you know in so many different ways uh and um, it was tragic to lose that opportunity by mismanaging the process dr husband yeah, thank you. I think I can clarify that a bit, Councillor Snell. It is a separate system. And um, so right now, we don't have the GP, DPR, whatever it's called. Some very confusingly sounding very like GDPR. But anyway, um, uh, we don't have that system, but the but you can still get the connection between the um, your vaccination status and the NHS app. But even within the app, you have to enable it. So it's not automatic. If you download the app, you can turn on the vaccine passport or just choose not to. Uh, and that's your prerogative if you're, if you're using the NHS app. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And, but there's other information on via the app which comes from their practice. So if you then want to look at your notes or your, you know, do the blood test requests or look at those or, or a prescription requests, that was, that's all direct to your practice. And that could be affected if you don't allow data flow. Um, that's, the bit, that's the bit I'm, limited, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm less sure about. But Councillor Snell wants to come back for the question. I, I just was going to add, and I know we need to move on, but I, what other people tell me is that is is the business from practice to practice on whether you have to inform your GP to share data with the app. Some people do it automatically; other people don't. That may be a historical timeline, but. They're all areas we need to nail because there's a huge increased interest in obviously NHS apps and uh, using them, and we just need to get the whole lot sorted. But I, I'll raise that and leave it. 
Okay, thank you. So, I mean, just if I've got Mark for your, your helpful um, overview, in reality, we want the government to publish what they're going to do with it. We want Dr. Osman to say whether he's happy with it or not. <laughs> <laughs> and then we need to make a decision if they, if they feel obliged to, that they have to press the switch. It's then over to us as individual uh, patients whether we give you a form one or an option one. But that might burden you with the administrative task of adding it all in. Um, Something top and tail of it at this stage. <laughs> um, but but um, any other question from um, uh, from members? So, I mean, Mark, could you do us a favour when you when the government is um, has published this? Can you just drop us a note, maybe through Jarlath, and then maybe we could um, touch base with. You? What, whatever's coming out of Dr. Osman in terms of his um, his view of it, because it so sounds like he's got everyone's best interests at heart in terms of where the balance lies, and um, that would certainly be informative to us. And then we yeah. can. Um, I mean, as I say, Osman's a GP in Tower Hamlets uh, when he's not being there digitally for Nell, uh, and and he'll be doing something similar, which we can then distribute across the much wider piece of personnel uh, to be relevant to to everyone. But, but as you've said, I mean, there is obviously a disadvantage to GP in terms of burdening them. But if members of the public who um, are concerned about this, they can fill out what is essentially a, um, a an option, a form option one to. Um, and where would they get that form from? Um, it, it should be available via the website. Via the their practice website. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So that that. Oh, and Siobhan's saying you can opt out via the app as well. Um, um, thanks, Siobhan. Okay, but unless there's any further um, questions, Mark, that was really helpful. I should say, Ben, but at the moment, we're just slightly hoping that there isn't loads of opting out yet, because if we are all content and happy with it, then we'd have to re-engage, as it were. Sure. So, in a sure. way, it's sort of a bit of a chicken and egg. Uh, in that sense. Sure, but I, I suppose from a patient's point of view, you don't want to be dealt with by government sequencing in the middle of August. Yeah, I mean, you can see, you can plot out how this is gonna, could happen. No, um, and then it, then it leaves too little time for that to... Um, anyway. Um, okay, so with that, I'll then uh, draw that item to a close. Thanks, Mark, and it's clearly something we can um, come back to when we know more as well. Um, so I think um, we're ahead of time. Um, with that, members, um, can I go to item nine, which is the minutes of the previous meeting? Um, can I take those as agreed? Agreed. Thank you very much. Um, the work programme is at the back. I think our next meeting is in um, uh, October, I believe, because of, of the calendar. And certainly some of the items we've been discussing is, uh, is a movement of mental health beds. And I think we'll have the adult safeguarding report uh, back towards us as well, and possibly looking at um, disparity um, uh, in mental health and maternity services is something that's been flagged to us that we're looking at, and depending on where we are at COVID, uh, we might be looking at that as well. So um, with that, I will bring the meeting to a close and say thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.